Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. Today I want to go over a handful of mistakes people make when starting seeds indoors. You can find more information about each of these techniques that I'm going to talk about on my YouTube channel, The Rusted Garden, if you want more information. But today I just want to cover the mistakes, give you something to look out for, save you a headache when you're growing your seed starts for 2024. First thing is lighting. Your seeds need to germinate into intense light. For that first 24 hours, 48 hours, it's really important that they're being hit by enough light so that they don't grow tall, leggy, skinny, fall over, they're lanky. That's a weakness that happens when you're trying to start seed sometimes by a window. That's definitely not an, enough light. Or when you have the lights too high and when they germinate, the seeds, even though they have light above them, it's not intense enough for them to develop a kind of nice stocky form to them. They want to stretch out, reach to the light. They spend all their energy getting extra tall. They fall over. So how do you resolve that? You can use different lights. So I use basic white LED shop lights. You can find videos on that on my channel. They're about 25 bucks. You can spend up hundreds of dollars for spe uh, specialized grow lights. If you buy specialized grow lights, they're going to tell you the distance to set up your seed starts. When using the white LEDs, you want to be two to three inches above the flats when you're germinating. After they're growing, after they germinate and they're growing for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, you can raise the lights. They can look something like this. When the plants are taller, they're less susceptible to growing uh, tall and leggy and kind of being unhealthy. The plants here have been growing for a while. The lights are much higher above them. They're doing really well. The seed starts up here. You can see the tomatoes are just germinating. Lights are about two, three, maybe four inches above them. It's going to vary a little bit. You're better off putting the lights closer to your seed starts. And if you have a problem, maybe it's too hot or too intense, and the initial seed starts are damaged or the leaves brown, then raise your lights. But it's much better to start closer and then adjust you know, as the plants begin to grow. The other mistake too, sometimes people make, it's not really a mistake. These lights, in most of us just have a small space and you would have to raise and lower the lights by the chains right there. If you just get some cardboard boxes, pieces of styrofoam, old pieces of wood, books, you can actually raise the flat closer to the light and then lower it. Saves you some time and you don't have to keep adjusting your lights. Also related to the lighting, Sometimes people only keep the lights on 8 or 10 hours. With the white LEDs, you want them on 14 to 16 hours. They still need a good, you know, 12, 8 hours off. They need a dark cycle. The plants need a dark cycle. But you want to leave these on a little bit longer than you think. It's great to use a timer in the wall. This way you don't have to keep turning these on and off. A tip, when you are first germinating your seeds, you could leave the lights on. When, once you see a seed germinate, leave the lights on for 24 hours for a couple of days, two or three days. That will ensure they get enough light to be stocky and strong and then go into that cycle of 14, 16 hours on. You also hear sometimes that plants don't need light to germinate. That's true. But if you have your lights off, you're waiting for them to germinate. You miss the germination kind of period by 24 hours, you could have tall, thin, lanky seeds. So I would recommend after three days, nothing really germinates in three days. After three days, make sure your lights are turning on and off. The LEDs don't use a lot of energy. You're not losing um, a lot of money spent by, you know, using your lights when the seeds haven't germinated yet. The other mistake people make with watering is they water right on top of the soil. It's very time consuming. When you put water down, it easily floods to the next cell. It spreads diseases and spores and problems if you have them in your soil. I recommend bottom watering. Bottom watering means you basically take out your container, you fill the tray quarter of the way with water, put the flat back or put the cell back in there. Wait about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The water will absorb up from the bottom of the cell or the container and the soil will go from a light color to a dark color. That makes a big difference. It simplifies watering and reduces the diseases being spread around. The other mistake people often make is they keep their seed starts wet all the time. As soon as the top gets a little bit light brown, they water again. Your seed mix will dry out. 
and you can see how this is lighter this is for my container where I fill up the trays this was just water once the cells get dark with water the seed starting mix has absorbed the water wait until the top dries to a light color your seed starts always dry from the top down so there's always moisture in the bottom once this becomes a light brown color wait a day or two that helps with disease and issues the top of the soil is dry the spread of fungus and other problems is lessened because you're drying out the surface and that does often kill off different problems but more importantly a lot of roots don't like sitting in soaking sopping water the water fills up air pockets a little drying out period does a well for the growth of the roots and for your plants and you can tell too when the top dries and you pick this up it's still heavy because water is in the bottom of the cell so wait you know a day or two after the tops turn a light brown and then water your plants from the bottom another really important mistake people make is they use the seed starting mixes right from the bag and unfortunately most of them are a peat moss based product and there's a good chance that there's fungus gnat eggs in the starting mix doesn't matter what brand it's just something that happens in the industry when you dump your seed starting mix into a container or you make it yourself I have stuff over here I make my own check out my YouTube channel for making your own starting mixes you'll save yourself a ton of money when I put the starting mix in from a bag that I purchased like this one or I make it myself I hydrate the mix with boiling water that will kill off any fungus gnat eggs the other idea is that you don't need soil life in these containers it's just not enough starting mix and soil for your plants really to do anything with the microbiology microbiology is so important organic gardening is so important for when your plants go from here out into your garden so the boiling water sterilizes everything you have a sterile mix you have no soil life and you're just going to be using fertilizers to take care of them for that 6, 8, 10, 12 week period of growth nothing bad can happen because you've created a sterile mix and people think that's an issue they read you need soil life that is true not for starting seeds indoors the sterile mix really ensures that you don't get fungus gnats if you do get them they are such a problem they multiply it's warm in your house they just take over the entire area they eat the roots of your seed starts and it's a problem I just highly recommend a sterile mix on that note in the house you can certainly use organic fertilizers I don't recommend using granular type fertilizers or anything like that maybe some worm castings but you can save yourself some money skip that when you put the organic granular fertilizers in here you're gonna see a lot of mold and fungus growth it's not gonna hurt your plants but because there's no soil life in here those organic granulars aren't really breaking down fast enough to release nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium to your plant and it can become a problem use all that when your plants go outside I like using water soluble fertilizer indoors now you can certainly use organic types but they do smell I use the chemical types people made fertilizers at a quarter reduced strength meaning if it says a tablespoon I use a tablespoon in a gallon of water and fertilizing is going to vary really based on how big the plants are like you don't need a lot when the plants are just this small as they get bigger you have to fertilize more often the tip here really is not to overdo it with dry fertilizers organic fertilizers chemical fertilizers you can over concentrate the fertilizers in these little cells and it's going to make your plants change color they may look purple they may get yellow veining and what we think is that we don't have enough fertilizer we give them more and we kill them off so I recommend using very little dilute water soluble fertilizer to feed your plants and I do recommend the chemical types only because growing with them indoors isn't going to poison your plants isn't going to poison you there's a lot of fear that if you use chemical type fertilizers you're harming something there's no soil life here you're not harming the soil life your plants can't tell the difference between nitrogen phosphorus and potassium they'll get everything they need to get started they'll grow well the chemical types don't smell they're easy to control and then once you get into the garden I recommend doing what I do go to compost organic gardening and take care of your plants that way and just to clarify that point before I get to the next tip you can pick 
first of all, everything's a chemical, even if it's organic. But you can pick an organic water soluble. You could pick the chemical type water solubles. They're both going to work. When you get the chemical types, the people made, they're going to be like a 24, 12, 16 NP and K. That's really high. That's why you're cutting it down to like a quarter strength and really reducing the amount that you're putting in there. That will over concentrate these cells and cause a problem. You want your fertilizer mix to be around, just generally speaking, like three or four nitrogen, one or two phosphorus, one or two potassium, and just reduce the fertilizers to get to that. So, you know, if you use a tablespoon in a gallon and it's a 644, use half, that brings it down to a 322. Slow and steady with the fertilizers. You can always add more, you can't remove them. A mistake people make pretty commonly is that they start their plants way too early. So it is middle of January almost. I have tomatoes and peppers going for an experiment. If, if I was really starting these to go out in a timely manner into my garden, I wouldn't be starting these until later March, maybe early April. People tend to overgrow their seed starts indoors too long, meaning the tomato plants only really need about six weeks indoors pop them out, you get them outside into the earth. I'll talk about that in a second. By keeping your tomatoes in here six, eight weeks, okay, that's great. 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, the root systems get coiled, the plants begin to fruit and flower, and then the plants just don't do as well once you get them outside. You want to really time things so that your cool weather crops, if you're starting cool weather plants that can take a frost, they're growing four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks indoors, they're getting outside into the right temperature. If you're growing the warm weather crops, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, zucchini, you don't want them sitting in here so long that they're starting to flower. The warm weather crops like to go outside when your soil is 60, 70 degrees, that top two, four, six inches. That's another mistake people make, is they get all these great warm weather crops growing, they do well inside, and then they put them outside when the soil is still 40, 50 degrees. Maybe you're not getting any frost, but it's so cold out there, the plants just aren't thriving. So getting down the timing for how long to grow, your seed starts indoors to get to the optimal size and then get them outside really makes a difference. Related to that is in, even in a setup like this where you have intense lights, you're moving stuff around, things look good. One thing that people don't understand is that there's no wind, there's no cold, there's no UV radiation from the sun, all these plants are pretty wimpy. So if I was to take the pepper plants, put them right outside, it's sunny out, the sun is gonna kill them in one day. The sun's gonna burn the leaves, the plants are gonna die. You have to slowly transition whatever you're growing inside to the outdoors over a seven day period. And that's a slow process. Again, you can check out my channel for more information about acclimating plants. But they have to get used to the sun the wind and the temperature fluctuations and you want to do that over a seven day period. Another mistake people make is they take compost, even if it's your own and you know it's wonderful stuff and they bring it indoors and then they mix it into their starting mix and maybe they sterilize the starting mix but then they add in the compost and that's bringing in spores and different problems, insects that can, you know, wreak havoc when you're indoors because there's no natural predators, there's nothing around. So you want to make sure that you're not bringing in any kind of resource from the outside and mixing it into your soil. A pretty common mistake too is people tend to overseed what they need, meaning you might only need six pepper plants for your garden, you know, six tomato plants, but people will tend to plant 12, 18, 24 tomato plants, you know, 18 pepper plants, they will seed, you know, 36 little plugs of lettuce, which is great if you're going to use it all, but the more that you're seeding, the more that you have to take care of. And remember, they're going to go from, you know, a little tiny plug to something large in your garden. And are you going to be able to eat 24 heads of lettuce over, you know, a 14 day period? Maybe you'll be able to. You have to really get the timing down. So it's a good idea to start less under the grow lights. Get a couple plants out there that are going to help you get food earlier to your table. 
But once you get them out there, maybe you plant some lettuce seeds so that this lettuce is coming in sooner from your transplants. And then the lettuce seeds that you drop will be coming in later. This way you get an ongoing production of lettuce. Peppers, you just don't need 18 if you're a family of four. You just don't need 12 tomato plants if you're a family of four. So you just want to keep in mind how much you're starting indoors, even though they're small, they're cute, it's fun. You can save yourself a lot of headache and some money and some time by starting exactly what you need to go out into your garden. Lighting, watering, sterilizing the seed starting mix, fertilizing in a very dilute way, and then growing the amount of plants that you're going to need rather than overgrowing really is going to save you a headache. It can become a problem when you have too many plants and you're trying to manage everything. The more plants you have, the more flats you have, the more you have to water, the more you have to feed them, the more you have to take care of them. Here's a good example of the lettuce. I'm just growing four right now. They're going to go out under one of my low tunnels. I'll be planting some more later. You don't have to plant everything at once. You can plant them, you know, over a scheduled period of time. So you need to look up how long, you know, a tomato transplant should grow, how long a pepper transplant should grow, etc. Um, you can check out my channel. I do a lot of information on when to start your cool weather crops or your warm weather crops. And the point that I don't want to get lost is that you may have beautiful, healthy transplants indoors, which I think you can do, but they, but they have to go out into the earth outside when the temperatures are right. There's nothing worse than growing a beautiful tomato plant. Maybe keep it indoors 10 weeks. It's nice and tall. And then you put it outside. The ground is cold. The tomato will actually turn purple. It's just going to struggle. It's not going to die off but it's not going to take off. So you've really put it out at the wrong time and you spent 10 weeks growing a tomato that just didn't have any business going outside right away. So you want to get that timing down. How do you do that? May 15th is perfect for tomatoes and peppers here in Maryland. I count back eight to 10 weeks from that date. I start my peppers, pepper plants. I count back six to eight weeks from that date. I start my tomato plants. And then you can just kind of make yourself a calendar of what you're going to start under your grow lights. Thanks so much for watching. Please check out my seed shop at therustedgarden.com and please subscribe. I'll be doing complete videos on just about everything. I start in January, indoor seed starting, go all the way into November, putting your beds to rest. I'll show you how to grow plants indoors, how to take care of them outside. And again, thanks so much for watching.